Okay, so today's demo is about building a cascading dropdowns in SPFX solutions. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying, hey, is that not a beginner concept that in that's in the Microsoft documentation? Well, the documentation has been around since 2017. It's not a new concept, uh, but SPFX has changed since then. Uh, and the article that discusses cascading dropdowns has evolved over time. It's got updates, uh, but we never really shared the completed code. So what we did recently is we had someone in the community reach out and said, hey, you know, uh, in Stack Overflow, how do I use the code in this article? I really want to do a cascading dropdown, uh, but I can't get the code to work. So we decided let's create an SPFX sample uh, in the sample repository, and let's make sure that it's got a, uh, a uh, companion article with it. So let's show you what the web part does to start with. Uh, so this is a web part that when you go to the property pane, you'll have uh, two dropdowns, a list for you to select which list you want to go from and the items uh, that you want to select. When you pick a list, it'll actually filter the items uh, and it will only let you select items from that list that you've selected. If you change the list, if you change the list, uh, it'll actually show a different set of items that you can pick from. So it's a relatively simple concept, obviously, uh, but you know it's not something that should be made difficult for people to use. And the one thing we should point out is when you change libraries, um, for example, like this, you'll actually see that we're showing a little spinny thing and we'll actually uh, disable the dropdown to prevent you from selecting the wrong item. Now let's talk about a little bit about the experience, right? What are we talking about when we're talking about dropdowns? I don't know about you, uh, but I, it really bugs me when I go use an app or a website and it's got a, for example, a list of countries and uh, state or provinces. And you know, if I select, I'm from Canada, so if I select Canada, it doesn't filter the list. It still shows Alabama. For those of you who don't know, Alabama is not a province in Canada. Um, and the worst part about this is that then you'll get websites or applications that will say, hey, the state or the province you've selected is not valid, of course, because Alabama is not a valid uh, state or province. So what you're telling me here is you knew it wasn't a valid choice, but you still let me pick it. Right? So you might as well basically call the user a dummy because that's how they feel. And again, I want to make one thing clear when, when we're talking about these kinds of experiences, um, we have a tendency to say, oh, don't confuse the users. You know, We need to stop treating users like they're weak, pathetic, fragile beings that can't handle tasks. Uh, we need to start thinking about the fact that very often we're all very busy. We're all very task oriented and often we don't have time to read the text on a screen. And we, we don't if we don't think about making things easier for our users. So in this case, preventing users from uh, making a bad selection, we're really increasing the effort that they have to go through to make sure that they've entered the right information. And that's often referred as cognitive load. So the more cognitive load you in inflict on your users, the less likely they are to like your solution. And it's not because you confuse them. It's because, uh, well, you make them feel stupid for making the wrong choice in the first place. Or you make them feel that your application is stupid or they're stupid for, making, for deciding to use the application. And we don't want that, right? We want people to be able to achieve their goals as fast as possible without making mistakes. And this is something that in user experience, they'll often, often talk about putting guardrails to make sure that people uh, don't make mistakes. So for example, uh, the other thing that we need to consider is that sometimes you know, we, we are task-oriented. We want to 
get directly to the thing we want to do. And it, I said, sometimes we're always task oriented, really. Uh, so we'll skip directly to the thing we want to do. In this case, if I want to, if I know that my province is Ontario, uh, I'll just go directly to the state province and I'll pick Ontario without really thinking about changing the country. Um, now, again, what will happen is we'll give a message like this. And it's not exactly the message we give, but that's the feeling that we're giving to our users. Right. Hey, you need to pay attention. And so this is where um, we need to think about improving the user experience. Why did you let me select this in the first place? You clearly knew that this was not a valid option. Right. And for the last year, we've been talking about using AI everywhere. And but why can't we create systems that are very simple that help our users in the simplest ways? And. What about the impact when you actually let the user save this choice? Like, what if I actually selected the wrong uh, country to the right province here? Um, is there something behind the scenes that's going to break? Are you going to try to ship this to the state of Ontario in the United States? And so we have to think about these concepts. So a cascading drop down is really something that's here to solve this problem. When I pick Canada, there you go. It automatically filters the list of options. So in this case, Alberta is the first province that's available in Canada. Uh, but what's even better here is we need to think about that relationship again between a parent drop down and a child drop down. And you know what I should probably do if you think about it, because remember I'm very task oriented, right? When I'm using this, uh, when I change country, you probably shouldn't select the first option in the dropdown. You should probably blank out the option in the dropdown. Unless, and the only exception to this is really if I, uh, if there's an option that is available for the, both the previous selection, the previous parent selection, and the new selection, that's the only time you should keep the same uh, child dropdown selection enabled. All right. So, Let's talk about how we do this, though, in code. So in code, as you know, in the web parts, we have a function called get property pane configuration. And what it does is it's responsible for giving you the list of controls to be displayed in the property pane. In this case, we have two options. Uh, one is the property pane dropdown uh, for the parent, and one is the property pane dropdown for the child. And what we do is we bind the options that are available for the uh, parent dropdown. We bind it to, in this case, the list of lists. And in the child dropdown, we bind it to the list of items. And we'll worry about populating that list of available choice, valid choices soon. But the one thing that we also do is we also tell it whether it's disabled or not, because the Again, remember, people can click really quickly without really worrying about things. I might take some time to load the list of choices. And while I'm loading, if I'm not indicating clearly that I'm loading, users might just start clicking around, right? So they might select an option and the option disappears. So disable the drop down while you're loading the values. And then what we're using is we're using a, uh, a, a variable that stores whether the list is disabled or not. And then finally, of course, we're binding to the uh, web part property called list name for my list of lists and to the item name for my list of items. Now, you'll notice one thing that's different about the child dropdown. I'm actually also using the selected key. Normally, when I when I change a value uh, or when I bind a value in a dropdown, to a web part property, it knows how to select the right value. But it's not always as reflective or responsive. Uh, so one, one issue that we ran into and we, we solved this is by forcing the selected key of the child um, and we'll set it to uh, blank when we change the, uh, the dropdown. And that forces the dropdown to say, okay, I understand, we've just changed the list. Now where we store the information, um, that we just talked about is, of course, in the list name and item name properties of the web parts. In the web part itself, we have 
two variables that we use uh, for our list of lists and our list of items, which are drop down options that it will select. I also have two variables to uh, determine whether the drop down is disabled or not. You'll notice I always start by having it disabled because the first thing that will happen when I display the property pane is I should be loading the data. So why set it to false and set it to true when we know it's always going to start as uh, disabled. Uh, one last thing that we do set though is the loading indicator. And this is something where we'll tell you we're currently loading, we're gonna do a little spinny thing. Uh, I know there's a better term for this, but that's what I like to call it. Uh, so we'll display the spinny thing to tell you that I'm working on something right now. Now, on property pane configuration start, um, I actually uh, load, well, first thing I do is I look to see if I should disable the list dropdown. So if I don't have a list of lists, I can't let you select the dropdown. I'll disable it. Now, if I have a list, but I don't have a list of items, then I'll disable the list of items as well. And then if there's nothing to do at this point, we'll just stop here. But this is where the fun starts. If I actually have a list of items and um, a, list, uh, a list of lists, I can start using my loading indicator. So say, hey, I'm currently loading stuff. I will force a refresh to make sure that, uh, if you think about it, right, um, the property pane is trying to do as fast as it can, as, as responsively as it can. But by forcing it a refresh, I'm actually telling it, hey, go take a time to display the little spinny thing uh, while I'm doing my loading. And so this is what you see here. When I'm loading my document, I'm getting a little spinny thing that's saying loading data. And when I change the list again, it does that. All right, so now that I have my, my spinny thing going, I am telling basically people that I'm doing some work, I can take my time to load the list. And the way I do this is by calling a function uh, called load list. Now you'll notice that I'm using an await indicator. So I'm telling it that this is an asynchronous function. That means that I'm telling SharePoint not to wait, or sorry, not to stop everything that's happening on the screen because I'm calling this function. I still want my web page to be responsive while I'm loading the data. Uh, so by using an await, it allows it to, to do this asynchronously. And one thing that I had to do to make sure that this worked is by making the property pane configuration start uh, asynchronous as well. By doing that, it's telling the function, I'm gonna have some uh, asynchronous calls within this. Now, once I have this list, I bind it to the list of options and I can now stop disabling the list. And this is what you'll see here. You'll see that I have the list of items is disabled while I'm loading, but as soon as it's loaded, it returns to being enabled. All right, now how do I list a list of items from SharePoint? It's the same idea, right? I just call an await function to load the items. Uh, but at the end here, when we're all done, I basically clear the loading indicator. And again, I force a refresh of the property pane to make sure that um, everything is being displayed. All right, we're almost done here. Then how do I get the list of options, right? So one of the things that I do is again, I said I call a asynchronous function called load list. Well, load list is a function that in our sample, we're hard coding a list of choices. In the real world, you would actually be making an API call or you would be uh, using PMPJS to make the calls. Uh, but this is what we're doing here. Again, this is an asynchronous function because they don't want everything to stop while we're loading. And what we're doing here is in this sample, we're returning a hard coded list of shared documents and my documents, uh, which is what you see right here. Now, in our sample, we're using a timeout just to make it look like it's working hard. Um, and that's actually what I do in the real world as well. Uh, it's waiting for uh, two seconds. Of course, you don't want to wait when you're loading your samples, but again, because, or not your samples, your items, but because this is a sample and we want it to really show the effect of that spinny thing and the disabling and all that stuff, we added some delays. Please remove that if you're doing that in real world. Loading the items is done the same way. It's an asynchronous function where we return the choices here depending on which 
um, items you've selected or which lists you've selected. Again, you see that here. When I pick a different list, I get a different list of choices. There you go. Isaiah, Isaiah, whatever that name is. Uh, and then the list of shared documents, I got SPFX Freedom Maxes, uh, Masses and Hello World. All right, we are almost done. The last thing we need to do really is when the property pane field is changed. Again, this is an asynchronous function. Um, all I need to do is I need to say, hey, I'm loading. I make sure that I tell SharePoint that the property field has changed to make sure that it's reflected. And then the first thing I do, and this is usually something that we forget. And in fact, we forgot this in our in the previous iteration of this sample. You should set the item to be uh, an empty string. Uh, don't use null or undefined. That's not going to force the dropdown to update. You need to set it to an empty string. That's going to force the child item to reset to nothing. And then we do the same thing. We disable things. We refresh things. We load things. Uh, asynchronously. And once we're done, we store the items, we enable the selector, and we remove the loading indicator. And then for good measure, we refresh the property pane to make sure that the app is being responsive. Now on the on property uh, pane configuration start, what we used to uh, do before is we used to do, uh, you know, call the function and then call a then and we used to do something, and then we used to do um, then, 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 right? Which is something called promises. Um, now, what we do in the newer version is we use uh, await and a sync. Um, so an await allows me to actually create code that is not um, chained and, you know, uh, and what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, a function within a function within a function within a function, I'm able to create a, some linear code that basically says, look, I'm going to wait for this function to run. And once the function is completed, then I will move on to the next step. And we used to do in a previous version of our code, we used to actually call the uh, display loading indicator. And what that did is that it caused it to display a loading indicator in the web part which was a great way to do it. But if you think about it, recursive, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Um, but if you think about it, if I'm using a mobile device, I might not actually see that the web part is uh, currently loading. So the newer updated behavior is to use the show loading indicator attribute or property of the property pane so that when I'm changing the values, show loading indicator equals true will actually display the loading indicator in the property pane, which is more direct, a more direct relationship to what, we, uh, what we're working with. All right, so for more information about this, we have the article that I referred to on how to use cascading dropdowns in the web part properties, and we have the cascading dropdown web part. And this concludes my demo. Mm -hmm.